Good afternoon. This is Jim Ray with the Road to the Autry Masters. Uh, we are speaking with artists from the Masters of the American West at the Autry Museum in Los Angeles. Uh, today, we are thrilled to have with us uh, Daniel Pinkham. Uh, Daniel is an exceptional landscape artist, and um, we look forward to learning more about his work. Uh, welcome, Daniel. Thank you for uh, thank you for joining us. Well, thanks, Jim. Thanks for having me. This is great. So, Dan, uh, I, I like to start this thing off with uh, getting some information about your uh, your your creative background. But before I do that, uh, I want to mention that you started off as a plumber. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so that's a little bit different, but, um, you know, focusing on the artistic part, uh, share with us uh, what your artistic upbringing was. Yeah, great. I, um, uh, you're right. I was a plumber for a period of time, but before that, as a child, um, I was always interested in art and drawing. And uh, since I was three, four, and five, uh, my dad, who was a plumber, um, he um, could kind of draw and never really taking the opportunity to draw, but he could. And so he drew out a little village for me and showed me perspective. And as a five-year-old, I was just fascinated with, with the perspective of those buildings. And so from there, I kind of graduated to drawing more and more um, and through elementary school and then junior high and then high school, I kind of thought of myself as maybe an artist, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the school kind of saw it in me and would set me aside for, gosh, you know, half of the school year just to do murals and art projects for the school building itself. So a lot of my friends would look and go, how come he doesn't have to take, you know, this course when he's standing right there drawing all day, <laughs> right on the walls, right? So, uh, so then after high school, I uh, uh, had set my sights on Art Center, mm -hmm. College of Design. Yep. and attended Art Center. And while I was attending Art Center, um, I really wanted to learn color. And I, I got a hold of Don Put Putnam, who was head of the illustration department at that time. Mm -hmm. And I knew him uh, because I was also doing his plumbing on the side, right? <laughs> so, uh, so I got a hold of Putt and he told, I said, I want to be able to see the green in the forehead like Van Gogh and the eye and the eye socket like a Rembrandt. How do I see that color, right? And he said, you know, there's this, hmm, there's this old Russian guy, you know, that's over in Santa Monica. And uh, he's uh, sometimes hard to deal with, but you could probably get along with. Him. So um, his name's Sir, Sir Guy, Sergei Bongart. And I left the class at Art Center, went out to, in those days, the pay phone, went through the phone book, and uh, found him and called him and right there from the phone booth and I said um, yeah you don't know me but I'm supposed to know you and so uh, um, he said so where are you at and I said so I'm over here on Highland and third and he goes so you come now so I got in the car and raced over to uh, Santa Monica and it was great because he had bought and lived in the old Nikolai Fashion home Huh? Right. So as soon as you walk into that house and you see that beautiful brick fireplace and that high vaulted ceiling, right, that Fession used to teach from, right, with his, if you see early photos, right, all of a sudden I was in the presence and smelled, you know, the oil paints and the oil painting medium, and I was in heaven, right. So that's really where a combination of Art Center. And uh, then I ended up with a scholarship with Sergei Bongart and studied with him for almost five years, four and a half, five years as uh, one of the assistants. And so uh, Sergei was known as a colorist, is that correct? He was, he was, you know, and uh, uh, obviously he was from Russia and he came over here after World War II. And uh, I, I really feel I couldn't have learned what I learned from him anywhere else. Mm -hmm. uh, he had the old European, uh, uh, we'll say, atelier sense, right? Um, he, uh, and I think the main thing I learned was, you know, there's a lot of people who can teach you how to draw, you know, certain things, perspective, design, but Sergei taught me how to live as an artist, how to put it all together, right? Mm -hmm. So that meant be careful with my choices, 
you know, don't get in over your head as far as expenses, you know, uh, just focus and study on your work and be passionate about it, right? So that was, uh, and in the Russian school, you know, you want to tie into the emotion of the piece, the emotion of the subject, right? right? And so I think that was invaluable, what I learned. And so I've tried to carry that throughout my whole, you know, painting career. Yeah, certainly as we, uh, as we get around to talking about your work um, uh, a little bit later today, uh, you'll, you'll definitely see the colorist impact on, on your style. Oh, uh, and it's really quite dramatic. So um, Dan, you're, um, uh, you are a senior member, a signature member of the California Art Club. Uh, I've known you from there for many years. You're, yep. For many years, you've been in the Masters American West. Talk a little bit about your, your, career, your professional career and how it progressed up to kind of uh, these levels of, of uh, exhibitions that you're now mm -hmm. featured in. Okay, well, like everyone, you know, you start off uh, as a student, right? And hopefully you're a forever student, right? Because you're always thirsty to learn to say uh, what you want to say better than you did the day before, right? So um, I think what I did is, um, as you may know, you know, in the late 70s, uh, early 80s, I, I started the first kind of plain air group in the country again. And uh, I had a school for about five years myself and taught. And many of those uh, students and uh, uh, helped uh, start the plein air movement across the country, right? So, uh, but I, through the teaching and through the miles and miles of explaining to people, you know, what to do on their canvas and corrections to make, and then going out on location myself, uh, loving the landscape, because I was a, you know, Boy Scout, Eagle Scout, um, and so I loved nature, I loved the Sierras, and so I would, anytime I'd get, I would run up, you know, to the outdoors and take my paints and take my gear and backpack in and um, sometimes be back, you know, be back in the woods three weeks at a time without seeing anybody, yep. right? And so uh, through those years of, of trial and error, right, taking little boards and saying, oh, this just doesn't work, you know, setting it against a fence post and throwing rocks at it, you know. Just so, you know, I release the, the frustration of not getting those yeah. two colors right, right? I'll, I'll, I'll stop right here and, and say that, um, unlike many artists that I know, you've mm -hmm. got a huge collection of those little boards, these little nine by 12 um, uh, paintings that you've done over the years. You refuse to sell any of them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And they are just, you know, they're your treasure. Yeah, um, well, thanks. Thanks. Yeah, yeah they're kind of like uh, almost a diary. Yeah. Right. My my life diary. I've got probably a little over six thousand of them, and uh, yeah. And so uh, uh, because you know I would go on the road, you know, and I I lived in my fifty nine Ford panel truck for off and on fifteen years. Yeah. Driving all, all over America, right? Working sometimes ten paintings a day, right? Yeah. So uh, always, you know, the key was always trying to to exercise the tools that I was learning but always um, trying to understand me better and how I interpreted my model, we'll say, yeah. if it was a person or if it was a landscape or whatever. So always with uh, trying to grow in my own self-awareness, how to say it better than I did the day before, yeah. right? So I think what happened is that slow graduation of uh, working on location, uh, being kind of what I'd say, you know, purist in that way, um, uh, didn't take photos, only pencil sketches, and then the on location paintings, right. Mm -hmm. And then um, uh, started, you know, I had a lot of art friends. And so uh, 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 one dear friend, Ron Riddick said, you know, hey, you should start showing in galleries. And this is way back, you know, uh, and so I started showing in galleries, and I built up that way. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, slowly um, got recognition, I guess I'd say, right? And uh, so then uh, shows like this and uh, like the Masters, right? Um, and the, maybe the National Wildlife Museum, you know, uh, would, uh, I'd get a, a knock at the door or a letter in the mail, 
you know, um, uh, asking if I'd be interested, right? Yeah. And so I came into the masters, I think the second year. Yeah, yeah you've been like there that. for a long time. Yeah. Well, great. Let's talk. Let's talk about the paintings. Um, yeah. uh, I want to start off with um, sublime moment. Uh, the the water treatment in this thing is is just amazing. But uh, but tell us well, something thanks. about that um, serene scene. Yeah, that's um, thanks, Jim. That's uh, that is a view down from our property in Idaho, mm -hmm. onto Blue Lake. And so uh, uh, during the you know certain months of the year, that moon rises. You know, right up that over that hill and onto Blue Lake. And so what I like about that period of time of day is the opportunity to really exercise your color palette uh, through warm and cool colors, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, values are all fairly close to one another in the painting, you know, uh, but the, the subtle color shifts and temperature shifts, right? Because you've got the rising moon Right. right, and you've got the kind of the late setting sun that just went down. Yeah, you've right? got that that red direct light coming into the mountains yeah. back there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, uh, you know, we I've talked at the Autry before on the fact that when you bring in uh, similar values on a painting, but different colors and temperatures, it is sent to a different region of the brain for uh, for translation, mm -hmm. right? And so I'm trying to trigger certain areas of the um, brain, we'll say, of the viewer's mind to have certain emotional, uh, a certain emotional reaction to it, right? So and that's what the sublime moment is when that all comes together, right? Uh, still waters. Uh, uh, still waters is uh, over near Metamont by our place. And uh, it is, uh, it's also late day, no direct sunlight right on it. So it flattens out a bit. You know, you've got the light in the background, right. but you don't have the direct sunlight hitting objects, right? Yeah. So it tends to flatten it out and make it more of an abstract, right? And I like mass. I like the play mass against just enough detail, right? So the mass kind of creates the need for the, because the mind has a appetite. Right. The mm -hmm. eye has an appetite. And so when you give it big mass like that marsh and that tree shape, right, then you give a little bit of the detail of the still waters. Right. The still waters seem even stiller. Right. Because it's in comparison to the large shapes. Right. So uh, that one, I think, uh, uh, was successful in that uh, I, I played with placing uh, uh, the water and the heron just, you know, in a certain location. Right. So anyway. This next one, uh, the color in this is just dramatic. It's a, it's a wall of color uh, yeah. back behind the, uh, is that a, I'm looking at a very small a canoe the image. Is that a canoe in the, in the water? Yeah, there? yeah, there's yeah. two canoers the in the piece. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so that was on Anderson Lake. And that was one where I was painting another piece and finished the small sketch and started to pack up and then turned around and looked and and the late afternoon sun had just flooded that back hill and it was just glorious right yeah. so it just had such a uh, great emotional impact and and so basic uh, the idea is uh, that that canoeer and his friend just happened to be in the right spot at the right time to be enveloped by this, we'll say almost divine light. Yep. Yeah. I, I had, believe it or not, almost the exact same conversation with uh, Catherine Steddon, who's who's new to the show. Mm -hmm. She was talking about, uh, at, at one point, she was painting a river, and mm -hmm. she turned around and saw this giant rock that was illuminated by this low-level direct lighting, and it's like, yes. why am I painting this when I should be <laughs> turn around and painting this lot. other thing? It, yeah. it happens a lot. You, know, just, you just have to make sure you put yourself in the location to where you can uh, uh, catch that accident, yeah. right? So yeah. lots of times it's in the car and you don't have your paints, right? Yeah. right. So um, yeah, so that one was uh, kind of a, a how would it, risky piece because it's a it's an abstract as well. It's you know yeah. two two thirds one third basically, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And uh, and it flattens out, but uh, uh, you know the hills 
with the sunlight, but that's what the light did. It almost took all form out of it, the picture, yeah. you know. That is that is absolutely Dan Pinkham, the colorist right there. Oh, well, thanks, Jim. Yeah. You know, I also, as you know, I do, I make all my own frames. Right. And so with that piece, I did a cathedral style frame. So wow. it feels like a sanctuary. Wow. Right. Wow. So, yeah. Okay, let's move on to your, your miniature. And uh, mm -hmm. I, again, the 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 depiction of color in this and the reflections in the water and all that marsh moon rise uh, tell us about that well that's that's right down uh, the foot of our hill and um, Vicky and I drive by it uh, quite a bit you know each day and uh, we're always on the lookout for when that moon rise is going to hit that uh, pond and that marsh and so um, I was ready and um, uh, you know worked it up there um, it's, uh, uh, it is an exciting experience as a, you know, we'll say a landscape painter, but always looking to try colors that I haven't, combination of colors I haven't put together yet. Yeah. Right. So, um, so that's a, an example of hopefully a, a poet, a poetic moment, right. And, uh, an emotion and a feel of quiet and solitude, but yet has some energy and has a pulse. Yeah, it's a beautiful little piece, and I can't wait to see it in. Oh, thanks. Can't wait to see it in person. Thanks. So um, you just told us a little bit about your, your one surprising moment, but when when you're when you're thinking about a piece that you want to commit your energy into into making it into art, uh, how's that how's that process work for you? You know, um, over the years, it's changed. Like I said earlier, as a student, you'd go out there and just you know uh, see things that kind of you know, triggered you, but, uh, uh, and paint it and do the best you can. But I found that for me anyway, um, if I don't know what I want to say with a piece, then uh, I don't stand near the chance of success, right? So many times now, um, I'll walk, I'll, you know, go play, you know, walk, you know, uh, bicycle someplace and see something that just stops me dead in the tracks. And I stop. And as a lot of my friends know, I will then pull out sketchbook and I will do a little pencil sketch, but I'll write what my emotional response was oh, okay. to the scene, yeah. right? So the emotional response is uh, really what drives me now, right? Is my interaction with the subject and what I felt and what I was, uh, uh, you know, there's a saying, let's see, it says, uh, paint what you see, but see what you feel, right. right? So I'm always trying to drive down to that point of what it was I was feeling when I first encountered the subject, right? So like there's a, when I used to be in the Russian school and uh, have the model in front of you, Sergei would say, so with the model in front of you, you paint from memory, right? Because even though the model's right there, you paint from the memory of that first emotional impact that you had, right? And so with the uh, landscapes, uh, same thing for me. Um, I get uh, uh, connected on an emotional level with what it may be speaking to me. And some of those uh, uh, is based on the big abstract shapes, like we've talked about. You have those big abstract shapes and they speak to the subconscious of each of us, right? And then, then on top of that, you have the uh, wonderful um, imagery, right? That people start to identify with. So if you can give the viewer just enough of the, um, we'll say the signposts, you know, to identify, and then you draw them into the abstract. The abstract should be consistent with the subject that you're painting on an emotional level, yeah. right? Yeah. So that's, I'm, I'm basically a hunter now for uh, finding those elements in nature that speak to me on an emotional level. Yeah, and a lot of what we see in your work at the masters at least, Mm -hmm. uh, is is pretty large form, so uh, that that emotion that you're talking about is somewhat amplified uh, by the by the scale of the work that you're seeing. Uh, yes, and uh, that's that's quite excellent. So it's now, very you know what yeah. not to you know just to say the size is also crucial and the shape of the canvas. Mm -hmm. If it's a square, it's more of a contemplative shape. If it's a, a rectangle, you know, then your eyes move through it. So it's a different feeling and emotion, you know, that might, that needs to be consistent with the spirit of the painting that the yeah. artist is doing, right? Yeah. Um, 
I think the last thing I want to get into, and you've talked a little bit about this already, but um, over the course of your, your professional career, your career as an artist, how have you seen your process evolve? Um, good question. Um, I would say um, I'd have to go back to what I was saying is I've, I've seen the, the process evolve some, but I've noticed that uh, I'm I'm more sensitive to the development of the surface of the canvas, mm -hmm. um, maybe the last 20 years or so, um, because I feel like the, the surface of the canvas is also an opportunity to, uh, uh, how would I say, exhibit one's uh, character, density of character, density of, of caring, right, for the canvas. And, you know, almost, um, uh, you know, how would I say, it's, I don't like it just being superficial, right? Um, I like there to be a texture that may uh, draw a person in. Initially in school, you learn that texture draws the eye, right? And washes, you know, will sit back and, and support where the texture is. But um, I found that sometimes uh, as I uh, started developing the larger pieces, right? The texture was a, a, another part of the tool Right, that I could use to convey a, um, an imp, uh, emotional impact. An additional right? dimension. Yes, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I think, I think what I'd say is the development of the canvas, right, and understanding how uh, different aspects of, of color, design, composition, uh, texture, hard line, soft edge, right, they all are elements that are key for us as artists to master. So we can say whatever it is we want to say, say it better than we did the day before, right? One of the reasons you were in the Masters in the American West. <laughs> Still working at it. <laughs> well, Dan, I appreciate your uh, taking the time to, to talk with us, to share some information about your, uh, uh, about your background and your, your, sure. your profession. I uh, hope that uh, we can see you and Vicki at the Masters of the American West uh, later on this month. Yeah. And uh, yeah. thanks so much for sharing your time with us. Thanks, Jim. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.